Hello to all of you. We've been hearing a lot on tools, processes, solutions within the funnel from internal, inside the organization towards the customer. And we heard a lot on these topics more to the back end of these processes. Right now, I'm bringing you to the very front end, engaging with customers. And the key question I would like to address today is, are you reps living up to their full potential? And this is a question you can address with whatever representative you have in the field, no matter what role, what function. If we do this in sales, the question can be more precisely uh, be like, are your reps actually selling? And the key challenge is that maybe, but it also could be that the reps have been already turned into what is your most expensive advertising channel. What do I mean with that? Advertising, if you look into the dynamics and the scenarios we apply advertising to, is addressing large audiences at low cost, and we basically go fishing in an almost endless sea of opportunities. And if we find a few that respond, we are successful. In selling, I'm addressing customers at the level of N equals one. And it's not whether I by chance match what's relevant to this customer. I need to find a way to ensure I'm matching what's relevant to this individual customer. So consequently, we con can compare the concepts of advertising and selling. On the advertising side, large audiences, statistical approach, usually apply to lower uh, customer value, consequently lower cost of touch points, and the purpose is you want to instill knowledge, build awareness, trigger desire that may be already be there. Selling, on the other side, you usually have smaller audiences, you have an individualized approach, medium to high customer value, medium to high cost of a touch point. And here you want to turn known opportunities into sales, provide individual value and guide through decision and action phases. Consequently, you need to decide yourself if in the market situation you're addressing, there is a place for having a field force because if building relationship and trust, and this is exactly what selling is based on, is not relevant in your industry, not relevant in your market, you basically should not have reps because otherwise you burn money. So from now on, I'm focusing on scenarios where there is a competitive edge when having a personal relationship and build trust with the customer. And now I kindly ask you really to go the last step towards the interface to the stakeholders, the external stakeholders, and walk for a moment in the shoes of a representative. And I start with the past, and that's been the past. So there's been the solitary commercial customer engagement superhero. And this superhero has been basically doing everything. And even nowadays, whenever we talk on reps or customer engagement in the personal way, we think first of a commercial representative in the field. When we go by uh, all the, um, the competencies we expect these reps to have, I have a list here. This is regulatory uh, savvy, data-driven. We could go into the details, but it doesn't matter so much because it's the exact same list in slightly different wording I'm getting from initiatives improving rep competencies in the last 25 years. It hasn't changed. It's just new technology, new ways of engagement are added to the mix. But what is the challenge of this solitary superhero? And, and maybe you have been filling in this participant matching functionality on the event app, and you have decided for a superhero. So if you now put yourself in the shoes of the superhero, 
you also will experience what the challenge in nowadays world will be to you. And this is because there's no solitary superhero anymore. If you're a superhero, you became a team, a, a, a member of a team of Avengers. So now you're not alone there anymore. You have others, others with superpowers. Some of them you share the same superpower with, some of them have totally different superpowers. Some have superpowers you need to rely on in certain moments. This poses the question how we came to this situation, and this is basically based on the co-evolution of the healthcare environment and the pharmaceutical companies. Because back in time, there's been the one-on-one -on -one relationship of a commercial rep with a physician in a single physician office. But if you then go the path to the right, not the path into the share of voice approach with mirrored field forces, that has been definitely more aiming on an advertising approach, then we ended up with a consolidation on the healthcare side and a rep having to deal with multiple customers in one account, a one-on-many approach. The industry reacted to that. New functions, new roles have been brought to the mix. MSL, for example, account, managing, uh, account management in the field, and so on. But often, those operated in silos. And only after aligning them into a, a coordinated approach, we came into a kind of a multi-channel, later an omni-channel setting. And on top of that, even the complexity of syndicated accounts of larger organizations has been added that requires approaches in strategic account management. But you see that it's not that easy anymore thinking of a commercial rep and considering this the in-person customer engagement. There's many more in the mix right now. So what is the challenge right now to the formerly solitary superhero? This superhero right now loses autonomy. He is now dependent on others. And now think of just this topic that's been around for 25, the 25 years I'm in the industry, Next Best Action. The first time I've been working on a Next Best Action initiative was in 2001. You may help some of your average performers to do the right thing, but at the same time, you also kill the autonomy of your top performers if you use it the wrong way. Compromised vision. I do not know everything relevant in the account anymore because this information goes to others. An identity shift. It's not me anymore. I'm a part of others. I'm basically relying on their perception to derive my own. New dependencies kick in, new functions, new roles, new activities, new responsibilities, and also there's a shared growth. It's not me driving it. So this is the question of attribution of impact on the market. And if you think this is already complicated, then the team of Avengers even changes based on the customer segment you're addressing. Because if you go from the left to the right, from KOLs across high, medium, and low customer equity segments to the long tail, you often have a different team setup addressing a customer based on what segment the customer falls into. So even with different customers, the individual responsibilities may change because you need to take over responsibilities of others who are not in the mix anymore. So this makes things very, very challenging. Interestingly, we also see here the in-person approach to the left versus a more e-commerce approach. This is what e-commerce is used in other industries, to really go fishing in a long tail for those who respond. And this also applies to the pharma environment. But as you have learned in yesterday's debate on what is favorable, the in-person approach versus digital, and we learned in this debate that you cannot answer this question because maybe the line is drawn not in the correct spot. The suggestion also may be that we look at it in a different way, and we think of not the one-channel mix, but we think of multiple channel mixes. One centered around the rep, improving what a rep is doing, building relationship and trust, and all the channels need to support uh, this purpose. And another 
channel mix that's more looking into reaching into the long tail, creating leads, and moving those customers that can be moved with just an advertising approach. And in some organizations, we already see trends establishing this. This comes then with the challenge to optimize based on the purpose and also to find a ways to kind of manage the intersection of both to either move customers between different approaches or to also support the different uh, uh, channel mixes with content and channels as appropriate. So this is kind of what's relevant from a rep point of view. And if you think of a rep who is asked to deliver a digital channel, always ask yourself if this channel, from a rep point of view, is in favor of his purpose to build relationship and, task, uh, and trust, or whether this is potentially even countering these activities. So this is what I would like to share with you on the digital aspect of the business. And I would like to move on into AI. What I've been doing, I've been just looking into what's coming my way on LinkedIn and what use cases of AI in pharma have been discussed in the exchange in between the pharmaceutical company, the headquarters, so to say, and the representative, and further on, the representative with the HCP. The interesting story here, once more, not only the capabilities of the, of the rep, but also this list hasn't been changed much the last 20 years. It's been just a new technology, a new invention brought to the discussion to support these different aspects. And when supporting these aspects, it is important, how do we define quality? How do we define success in applying new technologies? So this brings us a little bit back to the role of the representative. And again, a question to you, what do you prefer? Do you prefer your reps to be informed orchestrators? So perfectly enabled superheroes, enabled to have autonomy in decisions and to maximize the adaptation of their activities to the individual customer, or do you want to have orchestrated executors and you're perfectly fine with a certain level of missing customers' positions based on a statistical approach of advertising? And I do not say one or the other uh, decision is wrong. It's just that the, uh, the decision whether you want to have one or the other option has an impact on whether your field force has a capacity to sell or only to deliver advertising, to deliver messages to customers. What does this mean right now on the use of AI in a more conceptual way? Scenario number one, the orchestrated executor. What we basically do is we use technology to hold data and technology to analyze data and provide suggestions. Now the question is, is this some, such a suggestion mandated to be executed? So you go with a statistical fit, but your rep may end in a situation your rep is not delivering what's relevant to the individual customer your, uh, your rep is talking to. Or you do it the other way. You go to the right side in scenario number two. This is more the selling approach where you use the computing power available right now to provide alternative solutions to the rep and even to help the rep with AI-driven assistance to find the right way to decide on what is relevant in the moment of the engagement. So that way you kind of use technology not in a way you mandate certain actions, but you provide support in choosing the right action in the right moment. What is the consequence right now on the overall integration of AI into our business processes? So if you now start with the data analysis, the use of AI and the output. Now, this should be basically in the hands of the organization. This should be centralized. But in the hands of the rep is the decision 
on what is the right solution to be used in a given moment. And even by the choice of a given solution, we already have the chance to build a feedback loop that helps our system, our processes to learn on even providing better suggestions in the future. And if we then link this even into an impact and effect of what the rep is driving, then we have a second feedback loop that can be used to continuously improve our approach towards customers. What is the consequence from that? The consequence is it is important to consider new technology also from the perspective of the representatives and in general from the perspective of employees. And to be honest, I've been talking to dozens of employees and reps over the last month on this topic. And none of them ever differentiated AI as a buzzword based on technological aspects. They've all been looking into AI from their per personal perspective. Because on the passive side, there's the AI everyone is talking about, the, the media hype on AI. The AI they are exposed to in private life, the AI they are exposed to in the business life. What is the AI most uh, employees are exposed to first? A chatbot built for HR or IT departments to get rid of those employees calling in asking questions. If this is not a positive experience, what do you expect your reps are thinking of AI? And the biggest risk, the AI that potentially makes their role re redundant. On the other end, there's the AI that's altering private activities. My mother, 78 years of age, she's using AI to translate. She's not even knowing she's using AI, she's just using this one app on the iPhone that's doing the translation better than Google Translate. But this is one aspect our employees are exposed to AI. And this also has an overlap with what happens in companies because this concept of bring your own AI is relevant and this also has then an impact onto using AI in the business environment and the impact of AI on the way we do business and the business execution in general. And in the end, there even might be the AI that's offering new business or uh, new um, career opportunities. So it's very important to understand that talking on technicalities will not help us implement AI. Teaching employees on AI in a technical sense is not helping us to make them embrace new technology. And why is this the case? Because a solution is often the most likely cause of a problem. What does this mean? If you set a trend, this usually induces a counter trend. And where trend and counter trend meet, you have a friction zone. And this friction zone creates tension. And now the question is, do you drive change in terms of change communication and you try to rule over this tension? Or do you use this tension for having an inclusive approach to build new ways moving forward? So in consequence, if you engage your workforce in the definition of a transformative trend that may likely be different from a linear projection of the past into the future, which mostly uh, a transformation plan is, then you even use the potential of your workforce to positively impact the future work in your organization. And I'm very positive on AI adoption, and this is based not only on this um, uh, survey, but also on others, because you see a very high adoption rate of AI when asking employees whether they like to use AI in their business environment, and they actually do. But this is mostly based on bring your own AI and not based on what already happens in our companies. Consequently, it's important to engage employees in defining, shaping the path moving forward. We had a lot of discussions on customer experience. And customer experience is important because it gives us the right to come back and continue the engagement with the customer. 
But if you do not have a positive employee experience, you cannot sustain the, uh, the investment into your custom interface. So you need to consider your employee as your first internal customer in a chain of events towards your external stakeholder. And if you manage to instill positive experience on both sides, you have a quite sustainable setup moving into the future. One last remark I would like to make, and this is specific to the pharmaceutical industry. I'm also looking into other industries uh, with the same uh, discussion. This is, before you move into change, into transformation, fix the basics, ensure readiness for transformation. When I'm working with companies, 70 to 80% of the effort is on fixing the basics to only enable a transformation thereafter. And this is just my recommendation. Whenever you think of moving forward, first build a solid foundation and align with your workforce on that so everyone has kind of a chance to build a joint vision of the future. So what can you do? First of all, I have recommend, recommended reading for you. There's a ton of literature available, whether it's superhero comics or Avenger movies. The only thing I kindly ask you, if you find a way to get this recommended literature reimbursed, share it with me. I would be interested in that. That's basically the end of my presentation, and I hope this kind of little deviation from discussing on technology and what technology can do and how we can make these reps join uh, the transformation is fine for you to really look at it from the other end and to really think of, this is my, my, my last kind of statement, change management for the last 25 years is looking for the next best super glue to make things stick we throw at, uh, at our employees. I don't think we should develop the next best super glue. I think we should work in a way we may not need the glue moving forward, but we are able to engage the organization in a, in a kind of a joint transformation process that makes this obsolete. Thanks. <laughs>